did were it happened in infancy and childhood. So even though we've been talking about lifespan, our focus might be a little bit more in the childhood space, but this applies to everybody. Uh, and it applies to those who lost, ch lost children and those who are adults with congenital <coughs> use 
to make our decision. So what exactly is data? How many of you think you know kind of what data is? Yeah, maybe. So of course we go to the dictionary to get a level playing field to start from. So the brilliant Merriam-Webster, who I hope to meet someday, right? Um, they, they say that facts are information used usually to calculate or analyze and plan something. So that's the data or the facts or the numbers that we're using to make decisions. So what I want to talk about for a few minutes is why do these numbers, why does this data matter? What good is it? What can it do to help and what, what are its limitations? Which numbers are most helpful for us? And how do we find those numbers? Why is data important? Well, I have been in this field for a long time and I can spew a really technical answer that it's the outcomes vary significantly between programs and we really need to understand the differences. And that's true, but I have to give my awesome friend Jody Lemax credit for recognizing the second half that's in the red circle. She actually wrote this half of the slide for me one day. And it's really the scary things that make data so important. Unnecessary loss of life, child's quality of life, the patient and parent and family life is forever changed, a, a potential for increase in Medicare need, in medical needs, and an increase in financial strain, and data isn't always part of the equation. Data has a really good use. It supports patient-engaged care. It helps provide and support for shared decision making so that it's not the physician, it's not the doctor who has all the information and tells the family what needs to happen. It's the family being equipped and empowered to be part of that conversation and working as a team. See, there's that critical overlap in the middle that's so important. Data needs to be part of the conversation. It removes emotional bias, right? We're a hot mess. And we're making decisions um, based on emotions or based on trust. The physician has his own set of biases he's wearing in his backpack, right? He really, really wants to help you. He or she, I'm being a little biased, sorry. She really wants to help your child. But she always ha also has the, the medical concerns and the weight of the financial concerns of the institution in her backpack as well. So that is going to put a frame of bias on what she's sharing with you. Maybe she only wants to tell you the good things because she wants you to feel good. Maybe she only wants to tell you half the picture because it makes the hospital look good. So data kind of serves as the great equalizer. It helps to build trust. If we can talk about the good and the bad and the ugly, it helps build trust between all the parties involved. It can help improve outcomes. If we can identify a center as Dr. Earing was talking about that maybe needs to improve a little bit, we can improve outcomes. We can, we can help the families who need to be at that center by improving the quality of the care that they're getting there. But what it doesn't give you are easy answers. It'll give you a better answer than throwing a paper airplane in the garbage can, though. I can't promise you that. So one of the biggest things I get asked when we talk about data and getting that information out there is what exactly do parents want to know? <laughs> That's pretty much what I looked like when I was told I had to make a decision about my son's surgery. I don't know what I don't know. I really want to know, is he going to live? Is he going to make it through this? Is this going to help him get better? Oops, that's a goofy quote. Sorry there. Um, I remember yelling at the poor intensivist saying, why do we have to do this surgery today? He doesn't need this surgery today. And then he kept saying, yes, it'll help him get better. It'll help him get better. And so eventually I got it. But I didn't care about the numbers or the statistics at that point. I really cared about whether or not he was going to get better. And lastly, is my child getting great care? I think we all assume that if we walk into a center, we're going to get great care. And we need the data. We need to start asking about some of that information to ensure that we are getting great care. So here's just a little vocabulary lesson because if you continue down this road and we talk more about data, these are two words you're going to hear a lot. Um, outcomes data. So that's the information that talks about how things turn out. So that could be survival rate, how many kids survive the surgery or length of stay, how long do they end up in the hospital after their surgery. And then there's quality data. And this is what people believe helps distinguish um, 
whether the, the performance is adequate, I guess, or, or good, and the makers of the markers of good care. Some outcome data can also be quality data. But if we look at something like how many procedures does your center perform, there's a whole group of folks that believe that can indicate quality, that the more procedures that a center performs, if there's a certain threshold and they're performing enough procedures, that they will actually give good quality care. So people will talk about quality data. And I truly believe these numbers and this kind of information should not be just for people in the know. I'm really lucky, right? I've been doing this for 11 years. I have a medical advisory board of 18 of the most amazing doctors in the country that I can call and say, oh my gosh, they saw this on Nicholas's Echo. Can I send you the Echo so you can look at it and tell me what it means and where should I go for care? I'm really, really lucky. What about the mom who doesn't have those connections or the dad? and is walking blindly into the appointment and doesn't have that kind of data. We all need accurate, accessible, relevant, and meaningfully and effectively communicated data. So, where do we find that data? Well, <laughs> it's very limited and it's not very much available. So here I'm telling you we all need it, but it's not there. Um, it's really hard to find. We'll talk about what you can find and where, uh, but th there's not a lot. It's hard to understand. So you go, you get really excited, you find the data, and then understanding what it means is kind of tough. It's hard to make personal. So you've got numbers now, you've got the numbers in front of you, but how do you make it mean something for you and your child or yourself as the patient? And really, realistically, we're actually trying to figure out which numbers matter the most. So let's look at two of the key sources for data. One is publicly reported data, and one is the information that you can get from talking to your provider. Those are two big sources that we all have access to right now. So publicly report reported information comes from three places right now, only three. The US News and World Report rankings. How many of you have been looked at those in the last six months? You checked out where your hospital lands? Is your hospital on it? Right, so there are some really great things about the U.S. News and World Report, and it can open some doors to conversation. But what if your hospital is 55 and it's not on the list? Well, you can take that information to your doctor and say, why aren't you on the list? And then the conversation can move forward. What if your hospital is 11 and it's not five? You can take it to your hospital and ask them for more information about why they're 11 and not five. But it doesn't give great, uh, great information about decision making at that point. And there's also some things that we can get in a huge discussion about the quality of information, that it's self-reported and it's really biased based on um, opinion. So there are some concerns about that as well. The second place that you can find information publicly right out there on the internet is on a hospital website. Let's think about how we all love to feel sparkly, right? You only want to put your best foot forward. So Hospital A decides to put some information on the website and they put three data points on there. They're gonna put the three points that make them look good, right? Because we all want to be sparkly. I'm not gonna put my black tarred shoes up there. Hospital B is only going to put three data points up there too, but they want to look sparkly. So they're gonna put different points up there that they're really good at. So now both of these centers have information on their website, but how helpful is it really? Because I can't compare hospital A to hospital B. I'm comparing apples to oranges, really. So again, the data that's on the website needs to serve as a springboard for conversation. Talk to your center, say, well, what information are you putting on your website? And how does that compare to the person down the street? Recognizing this problem of apples and oranges, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons set out to find a solution. Now, if you think that information is collected on almost everything that happens in the hospital from the minute your child or you walk into the door to the minute that you leave, there are different groups of people who are, are, are dealing with that information. And the Society of Thoracic Surgeons is a group of folks who takes volumes and volumes of information from hospitals about surgeries. And they said, all right, we're gonna take some of this information from our surgeries and we're gonna put it up on our website so that every hospital will have the same three numbers
universe on our website. So you can compare apples and apples. The challenge to that is twofold. One, not every hospital has their website or it, it has agreed to allow their information to be up there. So again, if your hospital's not on there, it doesn't do you any good. Plus, the information that's up there, again, this chart is small, but it's numbers. I worked in this listening to lecture after lecture after lecture for nine months, and I still couldn't understand what the, what the numbers meant. I had to have the chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Lurie Children sitting next to me, explaining it to me before I finally got it, and that was after a 45-minute discussion. What about if I was in crisis and I was scared? There's no way I could have understood that information because I didn't have a degree in statistics, nor did I really want one. So then they tried to simplify things and they came up with a star rating. So we went from extraordinary complex data to really oversimplified <coughs> data, and now we're working on something in between. So this is the great work that Society of Thoracic Surgeons is doing. But this is only one piece of the puzzle. Dr. Earing did a great job talking about the team, right? It's a part of a team. So we need to start looking at additional information to be added to this puzzle, like from the folks in the ICU, from the inpatient doctors and the inpatient care to the outpatient care. So we need to really build up this information that's publicly reported. So in the absence of publicly reported information, we're left with talking to our providers. I mean, nothing can beat a really open and honest conversation with your providers. Sometimes, though, it's hard to know which questions to ask, right? The questions we asked at the beginning is, is my child going to live? Is this going to make them better? And are they going to get great care? Well, I think everyone could say maybe yes, maybe. I mean, but that's not great data, is it, right? We're not putting numbers behind that. So we need to know the questions to ask to get the right numbers to give us the answer that means something. Because it's really hard to know what we don't know. We don't have medical degrees when we walk into the room. So the goal, I don't know if you can see that picture, but the goal is to find balance. To find balance with your provider, to balance between the data and the emotions. And it has to be grounded in the truth. So I used to say this was a picture of my surgeon and I. But it's actually Dr. Earing and I now because <laughs> in six years or even less, my son will be under his care. So we got something to work on over the next few years, right? Because I'm, I'm on the side and you kind of lean it back on the bottom there. But he's got his feet firmly planted on the ground. Firmly planted in the data. I don't care how he feels like this. I want the data. I want his feet on the ground. And there's a name for all of this. It's called transparency. So you might see it on the internet. You might see as we talk more and more about it, what is transparency and public reporting? That's what it is. It's this open, honest communication. How can we get the data that we need? There are some solutions, right? I've been saying this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. Well, it's true, it's a problem. But there's a whole community of congenital heart disease professionals and adult patients and pediatric patients who are trying to solve this problem. They're trying to figure out which pieces of data do matter the most. Not which ones we want, but really which ones do we need. I was at a meeting in April where they had over 50 points <coughs> that we could have listed on a website. 50. I don't want to look at 50 data points. Give me five. Well, can you imagine the battles as we tried to narrow it down and narrow it down because everybody thought theirs was the most important. So it's not a conversation that's going to happen tomorrow, but we do. We're trying to work very hard to build consensus around key data points. There's quality improvement happening. This let's learn from each other and float all boats. That's happening because people, the, the centers are starting to share these numbers with each other. And these quality improvement collaboratives are starting to say, hey, we're gonna share our data with each other. And then maybe eventually we'll share our data with everybody else. Maybe eventually we can make that data public. So they're moving down the road. They're heading in that direction. The other thing that I'm really excited is happening right now is the building upon existing public reporting programs. Just this year, because of the work that we have all done, um, a lot of different groups are at the table, US News and World Report changed how they do their hospital ranking systems across the whole thing. They added a question, do you publicly report your information? Can you imagine all the hospitals? I was just talking to Dr. Jenkins. She said Boston had to scramble to make sure their data was on their website so that they could check off that box on US 
U.S. News and World Report. So it's already made a difference. They also, because we've had this conversation about needing data, needing data, not so much feelings, more data, they changed the amount of weight that the opinion question has on it. So the U.S. News and World Report has a question saying, where would you send your child? And so then you can say which hospital you prefer is the best hospital kind of thing. And they change the weight of that because there's no data behind how I feel about another center. So the two huge steps in the right direction by one of the biggest public reporting companies in the country, which is really exciting and thanks to many of the parents in the room. The other piece, again, as I mentioned before, is working with the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. They're committed to continuing to build and improve their website so at least we have a place where there's data about the, the surgical part of um, the process. And then the Pediatric and Dental Heart Association, along with Mended Little Hearts and, and several other folks, are really driving the bus to, with two new tools. And one won't be too new to many of you. Uh, the Guided Questions Tool and the Clearing House. The Guided Questions Tool is very similar to uh, the questions that are in the PATH pack in the Mended Little Hearts Guide. So if you haven't found them in the Heart Guide, I suggest that you do that, especially all of you who are coordinators of the Mended Little Hearts groups. The questions are in there. And it's very important that you know where they are because you can hand them to patients and to, and to, new, to people who are about to experience the procedure. We took those questions a, a step further and we worked with our, our doctors uh, to help make sure that the questions were asked in such a way that they couldn't weasel out of them. That they had to give us the data that we needed. The other exciting thing that it's done is it's changed the conversation. When we began, the parents said, well, these are all the things we want to know. And the doctor said, oh my gosh, you can't be asking us these questions. To, oh, I guess we should be answering these questions. It took about 12 to 18 months for the surgeons to agree that we could distribute these questions. They're finally ready to talk about the answers. The other exciting thing that we're doing, particularly with this guided questions tool, is we're testing it. We have four centers across the country that are handing these tools out to their patients and the families, and then we're gonna ask them what they thought of it. Did the questions work? Or should we be asking different questions? But more importantly, we're, we're plugging the doctors. It, was it really so tough to answer these questions? Did it help make the conversation better? Did it help make decisions better? So the guided questions tool is one of the first strategies we're doing to increase that transparency because it really helps that conversation. The next goal of PCHA is to bring the data together. The Society of Thoracic Surgeons has done it just for surgery. But there's all these groups of other information. I mean, think of all the airlines out there and how, how Kayak pulls the pieces together in a meaningful way. That's what we'd like to do. There's ICU data. There's the inpatient doctor data. Um, there's CAT data, but they're all in different places, and actually right now most of them aren't even publicly reported. But when they are, we, our goal is to really encourage the movement towards public reporting and to bring all those pieces together so it's one-stop shopping, right? Not that the data will help you make decisions, but that it'll be meaningful and it can be helpful in the conversation making and shared decision making. We got a lot of work ahead of us though. This slide, I'm not even gonna go into it, but it shows all the different conversations we need to have. We need to have as a community. So we've been meeting every six months to have these conversations. And we're so grateful that Men Little Hearts is at the table. Um, I know it's been great to have Jody part and Andrea to have be part of the conversation and really talk about how we can bring this data to the parents. So let's talk about what you can do because I can't do this by myself. PCHA can't do it by ourselves. Men Little Hearts can't do it by themselves. We need each and every one of you. And it was just brilliant what Jenna said yesterday because she captured what I've been feeling for years. That this is what CHD means to me. It's that change, heal, do. And there was a long period of time after I was changed, after my son was born and was flown for emergency surgery, that I needed to heal. Actually, it lasted about six months, and then I went into do phase. <laughs> and after, and that's actually when I got connected with Men of Little Hearts. But the do for me has now become advocacy. 
but how can I use my story to help the bigger picture? Every year, 40,000 new people are brought into this experience. How can I make my story matter? How can I make everything that I did matter? And advocacy is one way to do that. And Dr. Earing talked about some great successes in advocacy that we've had, and that's a whole other speech I'll save for another day. What I wanna do is talk to you about what you can do about data now. Share the guided questions tool. Share the, the um, Mended Little Hearts guide, the questions in there. Get them out there. Get people talking about it at your center. Ask your center if they would like to join the, the project, the QI project, if they wanted to systematically distribute it to their patients and, and join with the other hospitals, I'm more than happy to help um, promote that and get them engaged. Share this with newly diagnosed families. Again, get them when they need it. Get them at, right at that part of the conversation when they need it and they're making decisions about their child's care. You have a huge privilege through Men and Little Hearts uh, and those that come into your chapters locally but those also that you connect with online. I mean, all of you, uh, I've heard many people talk about the different uh, Facebook groups that they're on. When someone has a question, what, instead of providing your opinion and your feelings, help them dig out a little bit more of the data that can help them make the decision. And then give feedback. This is totally a work in progress. And on our website, if you go to conqueringchu.org, we have a form about these questions that you can give feedback. Say, oh, I didn't like question number five, it should probably say this. Or, I gave them to my friend, she used them, they were awesome, but try this instead. Um, so you can help, you can help shape and create where this heads by giving us feedback along the way. And then secondly, you can advocate for public reporting. Advocate at your own center. Are they putting their data on the website? Have they agreed to share their data publicly on the STS website? And then you can talk to your center about quality improvement collaboratives. Are they participating in the surgical group so they're learning from each other? Are they participating in the interstage group so they're learning from each other? Are they participating in the ICU group so they're learning? I mean, there's a bunch out there, and I'm happy to get to outline what some of those are. But ask them, are you trying to get better? Challenge them to say when I need my next procedure, I wanna make sure that you are the best center that's nearby or the best center that I can choose and challenge them. And that's what you can do to make a difference, but we all need to do this together. <laughs> now I have to say, since I've been doing this, I like to think I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, right? And I would say Jody Lemax has been the best mentor I could have. So Jody's the one on the bottom. <laughs>